next teacher is uh, local, so Anya Vandalinder. Um, and she's a faculty member here at Stony Brook. And she's going to tell us about cosmology with Gus questions. So, go ahead. Hi, everyone. And uh, welcome to Stony Brook. We're pretty excited to have you here. Um, I am here as a local organizer, which I think is why this is green. I am also the con one of the conveners of the Justice Working Group, and I am on the Collaboration Council. So almost all questions you can come talk to me. <laughs> Not a point of contact for see Michelle and, uh, and Mike, etc. And so in this lesson, I want to do two things. So one, I want to talk to you. I want to tell you a little bit about how cluster cosmology works. In particular, how we think it's going to work in the OSST era. <laughs> but I'm also going to talk about selection biases. So Chris asked about missing data. I'm going to talk about missing data. And to, to, to help you get along these concepts, I'm going to ask you to draw things. Okay, pretty simple things. It's going to be lines, it's going to be points. If you're very confident in your coding abilities, um, you can try to do this on your laptop as well. So if so, you probably want to load up uh, map.numkey and map.lib and know how to uh, draw random numbers. But you can also just on a sheet of paper. It's going to be fine. It might help you with some of the concepts. <coughs> so this slide explains how cluster cosmology works. Here we have a pretty standard n-body uh, dark matter simulation. And I've asked some of my simulator <coughs> colleagues, Yao yeah, is one of them, to now mark the dark matter halos according to their, ma to their mass once they reach a certain mass threshold. So, play this again. So, the smallest clusters, the lowest mass threshold we're considering here, they get little blue circles, and then they grow and they merge into, into green circles, and then into yellow circles, and then into red circles. And over here, we're just keeping track of the numbers of clusters as a function of mass. And of course, we see this movie as a function of time. So we now get a halo mass function. So number of halos is a function of mass and as a function of redshift. And this number, this function and its evolution is of course very sensitive to the parameters that you put into your simulation. If you added more dark matter, then structure would grow quicker. This thing would evolve faster. If you add more dark energy, that drives things apart. It's harder to merge something. So that's going to, to slow the growth of structure. You change the laws of gravity, this is going to look pretty different. If you add warm dark matter, um, you smooth out scales and smooth out structure on small scales. So you're going to change that function. So that means that that halo mass function is sensitive to pretty much all cosmological parameters that you might try to measure. And this is what makes measuring the halo mass function, and we're going to convert it to an observable the cluster mass function, um, a very powerful cosmological probe. For the experts of you, I point out that it's both a probe of geometry, because we're probing the number of clusters in a volume. So we get a three-dimensional um, geometric measure. And it's sensitive to the growth of structure, because yes, of course, we're watching structure growth. So this is how cosmology with clusters works, conceptually. Tricky thing is, of course, we're not observing dark matter halos, we're observing clusters. Clusters are largely dark matter, so it's good. That's what we have in the simulations. Um, on top of that, we have the icing of hot gas. And on top of that, we have sprinkles of galaxies. And we're going to use mainly the hot gas and the galaxies to go and find clusters, and also to characterize clusters. Um, but then also the, the very important measurement is the dark matter measurement. <coughs> so just a few numbers. When I say cluster, I think of something that has 10 to the 14 solar masses. It's very hot. It's about a megaparsec uh, big. And in terms of velocity dispersion, something like 700 or even 1,000 kilometers per second. So, with these baryonic ingredients, we can now actually... We can, question. So, yeah. if you go back, you had the mass. You said greater than about 10 to the 14. So, <laughs> is that when you start calling them a cluster? Or? 10 to the 14 is roughly the limit where we want to get to, to get the most out of the cosmology constraints. Mm -hmm. So, going beyond that, things get so much more noisy, and you're not adding that much more information for cosmology. So 10 to the 14 is kind of the limit that we want to get to. But whether you consider something of 13.5 cluster or a group, that depends on who you talk to. 
So, so the KT is the KT of the inter cluster gas, I guess, right? Yeah, that's the temperature of the hot gas that shines in X rays. And does that scale somehow in a physical way that's easy to understand with the cluster mass? Yes. We're going to come back to that. Okay. I have a question. So, when you count uh, the numbers of halos, now, does it, do the halo necessarily be isolated? Uh, that's the issue. Nope. Welcome <laughs> come back to that. <laughs> okay, good questions. All right, finding clusters. Conceptually, easy. You already saw it before. Okay. We have something that's big and massive, and some kind of gravitationally collapsed. That's in simulations. On the sky, we're going to go with the bearings to find them. So remember that 12% in the hot gas, so I thought it shines in x-rays. So that's how we can find clusters. That hot gas also causes, um, it causes a shadow on the CMB by inverse quantum scattering of the CMB photons. CMB photons are pretty cool, cool. They, they encounter the hot gas, so they get scattered up. Okay? And so that, that kind of makes a shadow um, on the CMB. We can, however, also just go and find clusters with those 2% of galaxies. This actually turns out to be, more, be the most sensitive. We can go to the lowest mass scales using the galaxies. And we've actually done all that. We have, we have cosmology constraints from all of these three methods. Right now, until I think the end of the summer, um, X-rays is the slightest constraints we have on dark energy today. This is a result from wearing the giant experiment of which it kind of got absorbed into dust. So there's a bunch of us around. Oh, yes. This equation of the previous uh, slide. If you, if you have just one uh, prediction of a cluster with one of those methods, is it enough to say this is a cluster? And take it out. And maybe more uh, for the optical part. If, uh, if you see another other city or just a red sequence, is it enough to say this is a galaxy cluster? Can you repeat the question? Oh. Yeah. So he's asking whether detection in just one of the methods um, is enough. Very often, yes. Come back and ask your question towards the end of the talk. <laughs> You guys are great. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is this on the, in the dark matter simulation? Is this one, two, or three clusters? <laughs> <laughs> okay, where's Yao? Oh, wait, that's focus. I think this is one. Do you ask your machine learning algorithm, Yao? Well, Yao, Yao is on, on, <coughs> on this thing, right? Yao. Yao so, um, <laughs> However, this, this is actually from the Millennium Simulation, and this is their, their, you know, their poster child cluster, so I'm going to say this is probably one cluster. Mm -hmm. um, there, there is a way to define that, right? Like it's, yes. It, Yao is not just yeah, looking yeah, yeah. at that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to come back to this, I promise. When you say cluster, it's slightly different than just talking about the halo. But if we ask how many of made the halos, a 10 to the 14 or higher mass of the halos are there, there's probably like one. <laughs> Two at most, but <laughs> depending on on the size of the simulation. Yeah, so so of course, so it's gonna depend on your halo finder, right? Yeah. Is this one big thing? Is this part of it? Is this a separate thing? This is actually where so if you if you just have your n body simulation and you ask different groups to go and identify halos, they're not gonna agree on all of them. Okay, eighty percent are easy, right? Some big isolated objects. 20% or so are train wreck mergers. And, you know, one algorithm is going to say this is two clusters, the other one says one cluster. Some of it might be four clusters. Okay. But, but when you describe it as just kind of a function of the cutoff mass, you're sweeping a lot of stuff into the reference. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is part of what makes it hard. I wanted to start with the easy stuff. <laughs> okay. But, but it comes back. It comes, it's going to come back in all of the selection types. So the numbers of halos based on the halo finders. But does it? Yeah, when you apply to the data itself, do we use the same algorithm to find do all the halo finders to, uh, to the data and uh, the simulation? Do, do we use the same? No. no. We, we don't. We can't because we don't have the dark matter particles. Right? We have, ah. this is great in simulations. If you're in the Z astronomer, you have this. Okay, this is not the same as that. Okay. So you need to run something different. What you need to make sure you understand, and what is really hard, and what might be the limit in 10 years, but not today, is how you go from this to that, and you make sure that if this is one halo, this is one cluster. Coming back to the original question, if you have more than one method, of course it helps you, right? Because 
I see a big <coughs> lobby, you might have two clusters and you might not know it. In the optical, you might actually see that you have, you know, two bytes galaxies with lots of galaxies around them. In the X-rays, you might see two peaks. So that does help you. It's going to be on slide so 30 something. <laughs> <laughs> I should just, you know, put it backwards. <laughs> this is where we are. At. So why is the drop mentioned with cleansing at the way? Right. <laughs> Very good. <one. laughs> so so he knows that I'm actually a weight cleansing person. <laughs> so we're trying to find gravitationally bound structures. Okay? And if they're gravitationally bound, they have hot gas that fell into them. So ideally, if you have a gravitationally bound halo, you're going to have a shear peak. Right, and you're observable. That's that's good. Um, but the other way is not true. If you have a shear peak, it's not necessarily a gravitationally bound halo. It can be a number of halos along line of sight. We go to law of significances, it can be just random alignments of galaxies. We can think it's really noisy. And so that's that's a separate probe. This is called shear peak shear peak statistics. And you end up probing not just the gravitationally bound halos. You end up probing something that's between cluster count and weak lensing because you end up being sensitive to filaments and so on. <laughs> so I've not sorted it down here. Yes, of course, if you pick up shear peaks, a number of times they're going to be clusters, but it's not going to be a very pure sample of clusters. Can I go to the next slide? <laughs> <laughs> it's done cosmology. Um, so this is this is a measurement of dark energy equation of state to 15%. That's pretty good, just on clusters, by the way. And this is only 200 clusters, in this case, X-ray selected. <coughs> um, they're also only at a rate of 0.5, and yet we get a measurement of their energy. So that's, that's pretty good. The reason that we got to that is because we followed up a large fraction of these 200 clusters, um, both with weak lensing, important, um, but also with uh, more Chandra imaging. These are selected from ROSA. And, and hopefully, if I get through my lesson, you'll understand why this is so important. Um, we're going to have, I think, hopefully very interesting ones coming from the Dark Energy Survey using optically detected clusters uh, this year. But then if we look at what's going to happen in the next few years, the next decades, we're going to find tens of thousands of clusters, if not 100,000 clusters. So and we're going to find them out to a of 0.2. We're going to find them not just in X-ray and Z, also in optical, all three of them. And we're going to have a lot of experiments with X-ray. So there's, there's a tremendous statistical power here. And um, we kind of convinced some, some dark energy people that, yes, in fact, the number of massive galaxy clusters could emerge as the most powerful cosmological probe. Yay. But there's a big if behind that. And that is if we can actually measure the masses of clusters accurately, because this turns out to be really difficult. And this is what's going to, to ultimately limit cluster cosmology. Yes, it might be how we connect a halo to a cluster, but measuring masses, even of well-defined clusters, um, it's pretty difficult. Yes, um, so, so we, we don't actually have a good forecast figure for what clusters are going to be. This one is a little bit hidden um, in Elizabeth and Tim's paper from, from last year. So this is a forecast for LSST like, I think this is statistical and certainly only. The yellow is from, uh, from the <coughs> galaxy clustering, the red is cosmic shear. Um, and this is if you are only to use cluster number counts without the weak lensing. And this is if you add three two-point functions, so in this case, uh, cosmic shear, galaxy, galaxy lensing, and large-scale structure, uh, you get to these green contours. If you then add cluster number counts with cluster weight lensing, you manage to shrink these contours by a very pretty large amount. Yes, we, we, should, we should make a better figure. But, and some of you might be interested in not just like energy. As I said, pretty much anything you put into your, into your simulations, it's going to have an effect on the halo mass function. <clears throat> so we can also measure neutrino masses, measure evolving neck energy, modify gravity, etc. And the neutrino masses, I think, is particularly interesting because we're not, I mean, we didn't measure the tightest constraint on neutrino masses right now, um, but we measure the tightest if you start freeing up other parameters. So if we're ever in a position that we want to measure both dark energy and neutrino masses, uh, clusters does actually pretty well. So that was the advertisement. LSST and cluster cosmology. So LSST is going to be an excellent cluster finder. We're going to find lots of clusters on small mass scales, relatively high redshift. 
But also one of the most important things is that because LSST is being built to be good at weak lensing, it will also measure the masses <coughs> using weak lensing. Um, however, our best cosmology constraints will come not just from LSST itself, but also from the combination with other data sets. So we're going to start drawing pictures. What are the ingredients that we need for cluster cosmology? So we need a prediction for the halo mass function. So number of halos is function of mass, <coughs> function of redshift, and a function of cosmology, of course. <coughs> we need a way to go out and find our clusters. But then the tricky thing is that our clusters, we're not measuring the mass directly. We're measuring something like the number of galaxies. So we need a relation between what's the observed on our survey and the actual mass of the cluster. So measuring masses turns out tricky. Um, I should also say we first have to define what a cluster mass is. So the halo mass function is, is almost always raised. And what is the spherical over density mass? So you find the center of your halo somehow. Um, and then you grow it until the mass inside that, that radius that you grew to is a certain number times the critical density of the universe at that redshift. So this is called a 3D over density mass. It's not just, you're not just summing up the particles in a friend of friends chain. It's a sphere that's limited to be within a spherical volume. So, but between, because this is kind of artificial, what we measure as a cluster observable, say number of galaxies, X-ray luminosity, is quite different. So it's not a one-to-one -one scaling. So all of these observables have considerable scatter. And the, one of the big challenges in crystal cosmology is determining the relation between the mass and the observables. So, so we assume we're, we're always in a burial situation where the collapse has already happened and it's in a gravitationally bound state already, or no? <laughs> we're going to go with whatever the simulations predicted is the halo mass function. Well, I mean, I guess the reason I'm asking is if you want to assign some sort of mass starting in the center and going out, it's sort of different if it's a non-bound system or if it's already sort of very bound. So, if you so this goes, so, yeah, so this goes on the side of the simulations, right? So, again, if you have the same n-body simulation, different halo finders will give you slightly different answers of what is, what is a halo and what is not. Most of them work just with a static snapshot. Some of them actually try to take into account the evolution of the dark matter particles. Those tend to be more successful in predicting what is a cluster on the sky, <coughs> right? Because it needs to be gravitationally bound so that it has the, the extra gas, for example. Um, so there's, there's differences in the halo finders. The simplest assumption is that the mean of our observable follows the power law relation. So this comes back whether you can predict say so the actual luminosity or number of galaxies, if you know the mass of the cluster? The answer is yes, in the best case, and we're pretty close to the best case. Um, that's, that, that does work because in the end, especially in, if you look at the actual gas, clusters are pretty much self-similar, kind of fractals. I mean, dark matter looks, looks pretty <coughs> self-similar. So the mean of our mass observable relation is a power law. In alpha and beta, we're going to assume are, are greater than zero. But because of all these things, the uh, clusters are not spherical, they're triaxial, um, various other things, there's intrinsic scatter around this relation. Okay, clusters are going to, if you have a certain halo mass and you connect that what is to what is your cluster look like, you're going to have differences in that. Um, and we're going to assume that the scatter around the mean is a log normal. Okay, everybody is a piece of paper. And a pen. So you can you can do this in groups or by yourself, whatever you feel more comfortable with. Okay. Part part one is to draw a line. <laughs> I want us to draw a line, draw, draw the mean mass observable relation on logarithmic axes. So, do we need to say what our observable is? No. Nope. <laughs> Just assume that alpha and beta are greater than zero. Okay? <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Everybody happy with those two parts? Need more time? Part one is draw a line of the mean relation. Part two is imagine you have an actual cluster survey. So start to draw actual cluster points. So each cluster has mass and an observable. The scatter around the relation is log normal. That is true. So um, yes, I should have written the logarithmic form of this equation up there. Um, however, if you take the log of both sides, you end up just with um, 
with a straight line with a slope uh, of beta and an intercept of log alpha. And to draw this line, I assume that the, the slope is 1 and the log uh, alpha is actually 0. So this is just a 1 to 1 line, okay? simplest, simplest case. Okay, everybody got the straight line? Yeah, sorry, but does it have a physical meaning of this log mass of minus 1? Oh, no. oh, this is, I've just renormalized it, right? Okay. It's logarithmically, you can multiply it with some number and it's going to say zero. But this just means that this is roughly the middle of the range of your, your data points. Okay, so the second part was that you were supposed to now draw an actual realization of your experiment on this. So you're supposed to draw points on this. And they're supposed to come from a log normal scatter around this line. So if we have logarithmic in particular, logarithmic y-axis. What does the log normal scatter imply? Gaussian. Exactly. It just means this Gaussian scatter around this line. So that's pretty easy. And so hopefully you get to a case like that. Okay. In this case, so when I when I make these little plots, the mass of the clusters is uniformly distributed. Okay. That's actually not the case. In the real universe, remember that we have way fewer really massive clusters and less massive clusters. In fact, the high mass end of the halo mass function has an exponential drop off. So if you're coding this up, or also if you're drawing, um, you want to draw your x values in this case from an exponential distribution. And yes, pay something to that. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the previous one, just where it's simpler, um, there's a lot normal by itself tell you that the um, width of the normal distribution is going to be constant with log mass? Those are some of our assumptions right now. Yeah. Um, the end of this is going to be a review of our assumptions, and this is one of them. It doesn't need to be that case. Right now, we cannot measure better than that. We can't tell whether this is true or not. And the fact this is long normal is something you see in the simulation, or you have some physical reason to think it would be true? We have physical reason to think that it is true. Um, in terms of optical, the biggest thing is going to be triaxiality. So you can work out that it's roughly going to, you always end up within a fixed radius on the sky. Um, but also, since this is actually, it's also the, the shape of this, right? If you're saying it scales with mass to some power, um, then you want something to go up by a factor of 2 and something to go down by a factor of 2 to, to be symmetric. Okay, so we have that. We have lots of low mass clusters, very few high mass clusters, and they scatter up and down. So, this is only an illustration <coughs> of what our model for the mass observable relation is. Okay? In our data sets, we don't have the x axis. Okay? We have at best the y-axis. However, we also we're not able to detect clusters down to an arbitrary level of our observable. So if you have X-ray flux, you can only observe the clusters above some threshold. Okay. So I now want you to impose a detection threshold on your data points. That means the y-axis has to be greater than something, and then draw a histogram of what your actual data is. Of your data. What is your data? So we can start on the side. Yeah, so if you're going to be doing this, for example, 
threshold on your data. For example, log observables greater than zero. Okay, so if we can only observe clusters down to arbitrary flux of <coughs> zero, um, of this whole, whole population we're only going to see the subset that is above this line. Okay, <coughs> that's straightforward. I'm going to slightly digress and talk about names of selection biases, and I'm going to come back to this. So astronomers have names for these things. And there's two selection biases, which are kind of mingled up here, but still, sometimes people make distinctions. One of them is called the Mumford's bias, and it means that you're preferentially going to always detect intrinsically brighter objects. So for example, so Wikipedia actually has an entry on Mumford's bias, and they have a nice diagram of what the Mumford's bias is. So Imagine you want to measure the average luminosity of stars. So if you just count up the stars, and let's say we can only see them above this flux threshold, um, but you still you go all the way out to, to some, some arbitrary limit, the average luminosity of your stars is going to be a pretty high value. However, you're missing all of these stars, so the actual true average luminosity within this volume is much lower. Okay, so that's you're only going to detect bright things. The other bias is Eddington bias. Um, and this means that, say, imagine you have two intrinsically distinct populations. I'm going to tie this back to our example. Imagine we have a few clusters with our observable of 0.5 and many more clusters with our observable minus 0 0.5. This is if they were in the mean of the relation. Okay? And now we add scatter. We have that large log normal scatter to our data. It means that then these populations actually over, overlap. And if you're trying to measure those few clusters with, you know, some higher value, some higher observable, higher flux, higher richness, it's actually really hard to do that because you end up being overwhelmed by objects upscattering from your intrinsically lower flux population. But because we have large scatter, you're going to have more clusters scatter from this population to that one and the other way around. Okay? So, in terms of this diagram, um, these two effects combine. And what it means is that we're going to have a large population of clusters that were upscattered by quite a lot, a 
from the mean of the relation at that mass, and then make it into our sample. And we have, from our survey, we have, we have no way of distinguishing a cluster that's over here from a cluster over there, because all we have is our observable. Right? We don't see the mass. So if you draw up a histogram of what your data actually is, you just get some log observable number. Okay? And over here, you have both clusters that are on the mean of the relation and clusters that scattered up. I mean, you could think of the editing bias as a good thing, though, because it gives you sensitivity to, um, to things below your cut. <laughs> <laughs> You can model that. Uh, yeah. Yes. So if if you if you trust your model for the mass observer relation, absolutely. Um, then all of this becomes easy. Of course, our model is a bit of an approximation, right? So that that's when it becomes hard. So don't you don't you just need to assume you understand the scatter properly, yeah. and then you can model the mass observable Yes. If you if, if you if you think you know what the scatter is. That, then you can model this self consistently. The problem is, the scatter is usually not exactly what we think it is. Right, so we'll come back to that. So, what we need to do is connect our histogram of we have n numbers of clusters of set richness, and we want to go back to the halo mass function, but I kind of now took out that, that axis that's the, the mass, right? So, how do we get masses? Um, Okay, I'm going to briefly talk about cluster weak lensing because it's actually mainly what it is. And of course, what else is this going to be great at? So, cluster weak lensing, yes, of course, this is connected to mass. And we're going to get some cluster weak lensing data from LSST. So just a brief, brief <coughs> recap what I mean, cluster weak lensing. Um, imagine we have the true background of round galaxies that make our life very simple. And for the cluster in front of them, and at the very center, we're going to get strong lensing effects. We're going to get joint arcs. They look very pretty. In no way, further from the cluster center, you're no longer in the strong, strong lensing regime, so you don't see multiple images. But each galaxy is still preferentially tangentially sheared, so it is aligned um, tangentially towards the center of the cluster. So if galaxies were round, it would be really easy to measure the mass of a cluster from that. Galaxies are, of course, intrinsically elliptical. And so the picture looks more like that. Now, if you look at a single galaxy, you can't tell whether it was lens or not. Um, however, if you statistically count average over a bunch of galaxies, you can still recover the mass of a cluster. What are the colors? <coughs> to make things pretty. <laughs> <laughs> and in red, they were exactly. The red one is the one that's strongly lensed. That's that's it. Um, and to give you a bit of an idea of the scale that we're talking about here, this is this is one over here. We have one of these pretty Hubble telescope pictures of baby bullet cluster. In this case, yellow things are the galaxies, um, the red stuff is the gas, and the blue stuff is the dark matter as reconstructed by lensing. So you can tell sometimes clusters are a mess, right? And these things are a problem. In this case, we're not going to care about what happens at the core. We want to measure the mass of a cluster on a scale that's roughly in between these two yellow circles. So it's way bigger than all the messy stuff at the core. Right, so I'm confused. So this is famous bullet cluster picture. Baby bullet. Baby, baby bullet. It's another example, not the famous one? Yes. It's your favorite because you found it maybe? And of course. So are you saying that, that's interesting, because I, I always think about that as being, we're looking at the halos of the things going into each other. You're saying that that just, that the big circle is actually the actual halo? Yeah, this is HST is a really small field of view, so it picks up only the center of the cluster, right? But we want to measure the mass on something that is like that M200. So that's on the scale of a megaparsec. That's way bigger. That's out over here. So the, in some sense, it's the color scale. They've chosen to go from red to black right there at the center where the where the dark matter is. But if or. yeah. Yeah, this is, I mean, that's a mass reconstruction from HST, so it's, it is limited to that field of view. They can't really measure beyond that. But yes, I agree. It's very misleading because you think that's where the cluster is over, but it's not. There's a lot of mass out here. So really, this is two clusters that are just barely, barely separated. Many halo finders would just find one cluster. Okay, I see. Thank you. So, to measure the mass, 
of a cluster, we need to measure those. Um, we, we need to have those shear measurements. And we're just going to, in this case, just bin up the congenital shear as a function of distance. So the closer we are to the cluster center, the higher the average congenital shear is. Okay. I'm not going to get into this, but the shear also depends on what the redshift of your background galaxy is. This is why LSST is important, not just for the shear measurements, but also because of the photoses. We need you guys. I don't care whether it's template fitting or, or something else, but we need good photoses. Um, but to get a mass out of these measurements, it turns out you need to make some assumption on your mass distribution. And that's, of course, that is a bit of a problem for what we're trying to do here. Lensing doesn't really care whether you're in a cluster or somewhere else. Lensing is going to measure all of the mass along the line of sight. Okay, so really, it measures the mass in the cylinder. Going back to the halo mass function, we have circle over densities. Okay, that's something different from a cylindrical mass. So if we want to tie our weak lensing measurements back to the halo mass function, we need to find a way to go from those cylindrical, so projected 2D masses, back to those circle over density masses. The other problem is galaxies are intrinsically elliptical, which makes weak lensing really noisy. If we're lucky, we can measure one parameter per cluster. Often we can only measure, you know, a few parameters for a bunch of clusters. So we do what all the physicists do, is we, we just assume that clusters are spherically symmetric. We fit a spherically symmetric profile, spherical cow. <laughs> but of course, as in the example that I showed you, clusters are not spherical. They're almost always triaxial. And they always have, they usually have one major axis that's more pronounced than the other one. So if, you, if you're assuming that this thing, which is, which is pretty elliptical, is actually spherical, um, then so what it means is that your projected mass depends not just on the 3D mass of this thing, but also how it's oriented towards your line of sight. So the same football-shaped cluster, if you see it along the line of sight, you're going to overestimate the lensing mass, okay? Because you get more projected mass. The same football-shaped cluster in the plane of the sky, you're going to underestimate the mass because you're not going to integrate outwards to light in a gradient. Is there a higher uh, uh, correlation between the actual orientation of the dark halo and what we actually see. Sorry, is there what? So, so at, what we actually see is the cast, the, uh, uh, the luminous matter. And, and the orientation of the luminous matter, is it correlated highly with the dark halo? Yes, this is on slide 30 something. This effect <laughs> is not just for weak lensing, it's of course also for, for the galaxies, right? So if you're measuring richness, the same thing happens. Your football shaped cluster, you're going to go and count more galaxies within that one megaparsec if it's a line along the line of sight. This is when do these two measurements, the weak lensing and the richness, are correlated. Anyway, just from this alone, those lensing masses that you measure, that you measure, actually have an intrinsic scatter of 20%. If, if we got rid of the whole, you know, weak lensing is noisy, um, and for, with some magic we were able to measure very precise lensing masses, we would still have intrinsic scatter. So the question then becomes, all right, so individual cluster masses are kind of useless. Um, so the question then is, what about the average lensing mass? Is that unbiased? Does that give us the correct average mass of the sample? Or even if that bias, whether that is calibrated. And that's actually something that you can test relatively well on n-body simulations. A lot of things about clusters are really hard to model in simulations because, you know, there's astrophysics, there's gas and galaxy formation. You make things really difficult. In this case, large scales, mainly dark matter, can kind of do that. Um, so we're now interested in, so, okay, imagine we repeat our experiment that we do on the data, so the weak lensing mass management on the simulations. Do we manage to recover the average mass? And if not, can we actually quantify that bias to a level that's good enough for cosmology? And this is one of the big things that we have to figure out in desk. Okay, we have to, one, we have to get those simulations or make those simulations and then do exactly the same measurement that we do on the data on the simulations to quantify this. So because we need that average lensing mass, we need either large samples of clusters, which LSST is going to deliver. Um, but also, we can measure individual masses only for the most massive clusters. So for the more lower mass clusters, we're going to end up stacking them, and we automatically get an average mass of a cluster. So you now get to perform a stacked treatment 
weak lensing <laughs> measurement of your mock mass observable relation. That is, you want to remember you made bins of your observable. So in each bin, you now want to measure the mass for the average in that bin. Does that make sense? I want to go back to the last slide. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay, so I want you to imagine that you're making a stack with lensing measurements. So you take some sample of your clusters selected by your observable because that's all you have. Okay. You select some, some sample of your clusters and you just measure the average true mass. This is how your model comes back in. Okay. So your bins and observable, they're just stripes along here. Okay. And in this case, you're not going to be able to measure the mass of each one of them, but you can measure the average true mass. So when you say stack, do you mean in a, in an astronomy sense that you're taking these images and you're stacking them up? Or what do you mean by stack? <laughs> taking the average. Take, take the average. Yes. <laughs> Don't overthink it. There are, <laughs> in detail, there are many ways that you can measure the average weak lensing mass. What I do is I measure lots of individual lensing masses and I then take the average. What DS does is they, they take a lot of clusters. And so imagine you have a cluster centroid, you just stack, but not, you're not adding the images, you're adding your measurement of the tangential shear, and you put all of that into a giant bin, and then you measure the mass. And you can do something in between too. But for this, measure the average true mass in that bin. number of galaxies, extra luminosity, SC flux, something like that. Okay. So imagine you found all your clusters. That's your initial experiment. You're now going back to your LSST data and you're measuring the average lensing mass for your cluster selected by some <coughs> observable. What is the MRI? Mass of circle relation. This is So we don't have the same mass. We have equal mass. So we're very very safe. We're not going to have the same mass. So like, are we closing my mind? So, we're also going to assume that we've done this exercise and that when we measure the average with lensing mass, measure the true average with lensing mass. Okay, we've done the whole calibration thing. 
Does that help? So if you, so if you do the measurement and the averaging right, you should just fall on that line. observable relation from your average weak lensing measurements. Okay, who votes yes? Who votes no? <laughs> I'll take that. <laughs> so, this is what happens. So, we've made bins just according to the values on the y-axis. In each of these lines, we take all of our two points and we just measure the average mass. In every bin, including a high mass bin, you get more clusters that upscatter from your bin below and clusters that downscatter from the one above. So which mass is it on the horizontal scale? So for the blue points, this is the true mass. For the red points, this is the average of the blue points. <coughs> In some stripe along the The query you're choosing to put it on the horizontal On the average of these points. It's it's the average of the. I mean, they're not. Okay, average. Yeah, average. Yeah, average. Yeah, average. So it's always above the line. Yeah. 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 We're gonna go. We're gonna go again through. Which of these points can you see in your data, and which ones you cannot? So, orange points, of course, you cannot see, but the, we don't detect them. Blue points, we only know their y-axis values. We only know the observables. We don't know the mass of each blue point. However, because of the weak lensing, we can reconstruct the ensemble mass of some set of blue points. Okay, so this is what ends up being our data if we only have custom comes, and we only have the average weak lensing mass. Turns out this is not on the same line as the true mass mean observable relation. So if you just plug this into your cosmology, you're going to get the wrong answer. If you know what the scatter is and the slope of your mass function, then you can model this. So do you reconstruct the rates? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. You raised your hand. I didn't raise my hand. You have to also know the correlation, right, between the yeah. unobservable and your lensing. Yes. The, the correlation yes. is scatter. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So do you, do you get the slope right, even if you get the normalization wrong? If you go to high enough, like, it's clearly yeah. at your selection. 
threshold here? That's a great question, Alex. Um, and I don't know the answer. In this case, um, the halo mass function has, you know, it's just one exponential drop off, right? There's no change in slope. So it doesn't have the turnover that the true halo mass function has, which I think, even if it's true in this toy model, means it would not be true in the real data. Yeah. I, I still not sure I quite understand why in the, in the very high, so if you go very high and your wave you're observable is, so if you make the assumption that there, it, you know, at that point there is no more faint uh, distribution. Yeah, so no, I, 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 I get that point that there is always this underlying, but do you, is, is there not a point where you can say I'm not complete, I've found everything in this mass bin? Is that a statement that there's always some faint? Yeah, yeah but, but you're not binning a mass. You cannot bin a mass because you haven't measured this quantity of every cluster mm -hmm. at this point. You can only bin in what is on the y-axis. Okay, so your point is that you're getting some upscattering from... Uh, yes, from because, because it's always it's always the same exponential distribution. You always have more upscatter than upscatter. So you just have to tell them. Yeah, yeah, yes. Okay, how do we get the true mass observable relation? Everybody says, all right, if we know the scatter and we know the slope, then we can do that. That's true. But that requires us to actually be able to simulate clusters, including, you know, the richness observables. And how many of them have cool cores correctly? That's very difficult because of astrophysics. Okay. It turns out you can do this, you can get a huge boost by doing this empirically, by adding follow-up observations, which get you some of this information. Okay, this is this is why cluster cosmology is LSST, is it cannot live in a bubble. This is why we're gonna need extra information from other observables. So what helps us tremendously is that if we go and we follow up some of our clusters um, with actually telescopes, so right now Chandra and, Chandra and, uh, and XML, we can measure mass proxies, which have much lower scatter with a true 3D mass um, than our survey observables. Okay, So things like the temperature of our gas, um, the gas mass, so, so the mass that's in the hot X-ray gas, and actually, the product of these two, they have very small scatter. And we have a limit of, I think, more less than 7% on the gas mass. These things don't measure the absolute mass of a cluster, but they measure something that correlates very tightly with the actual mass of the cluster. So imagine now for all of these blue points, I have the luxury and I've gone and measured them in x-rays. I can then make this plot for, and I should have left off the orange point, I can then make exactly this plot where I plot or observable against the true mass of the cluster, except that if I only have these things, there's some factor that I still need to calibrate. Okay, but it allows us to reconstruct the shape of this relation, including the scatter, including the slope. Now, if you combine it with the weak lensing, the weak lensing then just gives you this factor of how to make this the true mass. If the mass times the constant, that is the constant then it's just horizontally shifts, and actually the slope is the same as you are assuming the slope is the same as the true slope, <coughs> right? Uh, I'm not sure I understand your question. So I'm asking you to forget about the weak lensing for a little bit, and now instead of having the weak lensing for each detected cluster, you go and you have the X-ray for each detected cluster. You have the gas mass. Say the gas mass is 10% of the true mass. For every cluster, it's 10% of the true mass. Okay. Then what is on your x-axis is true mass times 0.1. Okay. So you have the exact same shape. Okay. This doesn't give you the the total mass, but only some some number that scales with it. But you can still use it to reconstruct the shape of this thing, which is what weak lensing could not give you. Okay. We glance and then comes in and calibrates all of it. So you now get both things. So why is the scatter intrinsically less for X-ray measurement than lensing? Right. Um, so note that I left out X-ray luminosity. Okay. What we're now looking at is the gas that's away from the core, and it turns out in X-rays clusters are, look much more spherical than all of the other things, and that's because of two things. The, the X-ray gas follows the potential. The potential is more spherical than the actual dark matter distribution. 
the other part is that the X-ray emissivity um, goes with density squared. So you're much more weighted towards the core, and it ends up making it look much more spherical. I didn't follow the point about the potential, since the dark matter is what's making the gravitational potential. How could it be different? Well, one of them is a density, and one of them is a potential. Everything looks like a monopole far away. Okay. Just so the point is, you're just dealing with something farther away from the core. So, so we get part of it is that we get rid of the core because the core is really messy. Okay. And then, so if for extra observation, if we cut out the core, clusters actually look so similar and almost circular. Yes, there's still a little bit of scatter, so you know, seven percent, ten percent, but it's much smaller than all the other ones. And this is what makes this thing so useful. For X-ray, each, each, each individual point, you know the mass. You know something that scales with mass yeah, the time times the time. factor that you get from the glancing. But you, need you, don't, you don't have to handle the average, but just each point you... Exactly, know. now you get each point. You can do this for each point. Well, it's expensive, but <laughs> you can do this. So, if you have both of them, if you have the weak lensing and you have the low scatter mass proxies, you can reconstruct your mass observable relation for detected clusters. So, if you were to just fit a straight line to this, what do you think would happen? It would be terribly skewed, exactly. So, that's what happens. You end up. So, in this case, you have something which I learned this for this talk. This is now not missing data, it's truncated data. Missing data means you measure it, so you would measure a cluster, but you only get a lower limit, an upper limit on the observables. In this case, it's truncated data. We don't see anything below this detection threshold. But you, you can actually model this correctly with, with maximum likelihood methods. Just remember, just don't just do ordinary least squares. And um, here's a real world example. This goes back to, to the X-ray clusters. So for these, we had both the Chandra X-ray telescope follow-up, so we get low scatter mass proxies, and the weak lensing follow-up in this case. <coughs> and so this is the mass observable relation. Um, the points here are, so now it's the luminosity, is the survey observable, and we're also showing the weak lensing measurements. And after folding this through all of all cosmology, scaling relation score, which takes care of all of these things, this is actually, this is our best fit for the mean mass relation. Okay, so you see, you would have never gotten this out of these points if you didn't take into account all of these effects. So yes, this, you know, all of these things, they happen. And, um, and so, of course, what, what we need to do for pretty much, for, for all cosmology, just account of cosmology experiments, getting these low, well, so the weak lensing, LCT is going to do. But we also need to have this X-ray follow-up. And this is, this is one quantification which I think was specific for DES, where this is a plot of the improvement in the figure of merit as a function of uh, the number of cluster follow-up observations to get these low scatter mass proxies. So in the archives, we already have a few hundreds of these. And so if we make use of them, we can improve our figure of merit for dark energy by a factor of two to three. So to do cosmology, um, the things that the things that are on both the x-axis and the y-axis, those measurements, they're not independent. In general, they're not independent of cosmology. Okay. If this is a weak lensing mass, then you're dealing with angular diameter distances. So to get a mass, you need to assume a cosmology. In terms of luminosity, is also a good example for this because you measure the flux of the cluster and you measure the redshift. But you need to convert the redshift again to a distance to get the luminosity. So these things are actually not independent of cosmology, and that means that you actually have to solve all the cosmology and the scaling relations of the mass observable relation at the same time. So this is where you know you have to write a big, like fairly complicated, like the old code. Can I use five minutes, maybe seven minutes to go all of the things that we assume that are, if we look at it in detail, are not actually true. So the things that we looked at. So we assumed the mean mass observable relation follows a power law. Um, we assume that the shape of the intrinsic scatter is log normal. 
And we also assume that this, the size of the intrinsic scatter is constant with mass. And we assume that the scatter in the cleansing mass is independent of the scatter in the observables. So how good are these assumptions? Here's my list of pros and cons of different cluster finders. So in the optical, the optical cluster samples give us the highest completeness. Every galaxy lives in a halo, so that's pretty good. Um, however, they're subject to projection effects. If you see two galaxies are in the same halo or not, sometimes you're going to get it wrong. Sometimes you're going to catastrophically miscenter your clusters because you picked the wrong central galaxy. X-rays, in principle, would, be very, would have very high purity and completeness because every time you see an extended source is extragalactic, it's a cluster. In practice, every X-ray telescope has a limited, um, every survey telescope has a limited resolution. And so you're going to get both impurity and incompleteness due to AGMs. If you have limited, limited resolution, you have a super bright AGM at the core. It might be a cluster, but it's going to look like a point source. You're not going to identify as a cluster. Or you might have a bunch of smaller AGM in a cluster that are just nearby, but they look like an extended course, but are not a cluster. The other thing is that clusters, they have at the center, they have these cool cores, which get really, really bright. Right? It's a runaway process. And so extra selection actually has a 40% scatter, which is huge. The Z effect, this is the shadow on the CMB. The nice thing here is that we're not depending on something in the cluster emitting photons. Um, because of that, because we're just measuring a shadow on the CMB, they have a redshift independent mass selection threshold. They're, they're, they have pretty good purity and completeness. They also have a smaller scatter in the observable with the mass um, than at least x ray However, um, the scatter is not mostly caused also by triaxiality and orientation, so the same as, as in weak lensing. So I want to use a bit of time for you to brainstorm which of these assumptions is broken for which cluster finder. I hope you paid attention on the last one. <laughs> 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 we need both slides at the same time. Actually, you just have to write down the three types, I guess. Yeah. We can't keep three things in our head anyway. It's almost mentioned. Yeah. Now we have to see it. I'm just looking for examples, right? I'm not going to go through a complete list. If you think of one, just raise your hand. Or shout it out. Yeah. So you're asking if you have a cluster without x-rays. Yeah. Okay, why does the cluster not have x-rays? Yeah, and it could be. Uh, and the question also is, uh, can it could be a problem? Or... Uh, okay, but I'm asking you, why does your cluster not have x-rays? It's a cluster, it should have x-rays. <laughs> <laughs> if, like, if you have a gravitationally bound halo, then matter is going to fall into it, yeah. including the gas. It gets shocked with it. Every gravitation around halo should be emitting an X-ray. Yeah, but that's just the core, right? That, that goes back to goes back to the bullet cluster. Um, the offset happens on really small scales, right? It's not going to happen on the scale of, of a megaparsec. So SC is really a proxy for temperature, right? So this goes back to my, my, original, my original question. So if the temperature doesn't scale with the mass, then that mass relationship won't be true. Temperature scales with mass very well. In fact, it's one of our low scatter mass proxy, except it's not the lowest scatter mass proxy, so we don't like it as much as the other one. And it's hard to measure. Do you want us to talk about this among yourselves? I want you to shout out suggestions, but maybe raise your hand first. Mike. So it seems like the optical identification <coughs> of clusters is going to break the scattered sequence in mass. 
yes. of clusters you have trouble identifying on the five minutes Correct. Correct. So so yes, so optical also has seen the scatter in the observables correlated with the scatter in the weak lensing. Both if you think of the football shaped cluster, even if you get everything right, you're gonna get more galaxies and so you give them circle. You're also gonna get a larger SC decrement. Mid centering, yes, I was like um, absolutely. One more. Okay, I think people wanna go to lunch. Um, right, so so yes. Optical NSC scatter correlates with like lensing. I also wrote down X-ray luminosity because that huge scatter in X-ray luminosity is caused by whether the cluster has a cool core or not. So you might expect that you actually get a bimodal scatter. We haven't measured this yet, but that would be your expectation. Um, for weak lensing, and I think for optical NSE, if you have projection effects that go beyond the actual halo, you end up with a somewhat skewed relation. Things don't look not normal. They have a bit of a tail towards high scatter. Other problems, is it one cluster, two clusters? <laughs> yeah. This is in the end going from, you know, this case to that, or does this halo kind of say this is one halo or two halos? It's going to be a problem. We're not at the point that it's a problem yet. It's going to become a problem. Um, I have a few more, just a few more. So, completeness and purity. This is, you know, you need your number counts. <coughs> if you're incomplete, so you're missing clusters, you underestimate your number counts. It's a problem. Your purity, how many false positives are there? It's a problem for your number counts. It's also a problem for your mass observable relation, especially if you're just doing stack weak lensing. Because the way that you can think of it is that suppose you have your relation here, and then you have a bunch of actually um, halos which are way, way less massive than the other ones. But some of them you actually you end up uh, scattering up. You have no idea. You, have, you end up having, even if this is a log normal distribution, you're going to have a really large tail towards low masses. So you need to know how many type of false positives you have. The, the correlation between um, the scatter and the lensing mass and the observables was actually quantified for a bunch of uh, um, optical cluster finders. They measured the axis ratio along the line of sight um, in bins of the uh, the observables of the number of galaxies, and you can see that it's actually offset. Uh, the clusters end up to be preferentially lined along, along, along the site. Miscentering, you get the wrong cluster center. That means you underestimate your observable. You count, you, you count fewer galaxies. You also underestimate your lensing mass. So yes, all of these are problems. So, many of these we learn more if we actually have those X-rays and the galaxies. Right. If we have something that's you know huge according to richness, but it doesn't have X-rays, probably not a gravitationally bound halo. And so if we can combine with other surveys, then we can learn a lot more about everything from triaxiality to miscentering, but also purity and completeness. So in the end, we want to do cosmology from, from multi-wavelength analyses. And, uh, and so it's actually really good news because we're going we're gonna to have not only LSST, but we're going to have cluster surveys in many wavelengths. So Steve will do the optical, and DS is already on testing on for that. Uh, we're also going to have a C surveys and X rays um, that will survey the southern sky versus T sky. So we're going to have the synergy between cluster finding and also mass determinations from all of these. The thing that the other ones can't really do is the, is the weak lensing mass calibration. So this is where LSST is really important. Um, I think I'm going to stop there because it's time for lunch. Thank you.